I thought I might make a deal with you. Uh, since I'm on tonight, I thought we might finish a little bit early and uh, make some sort of compromise. So maybe we'll go till uh, quarter to five or something. Now, Debbie over there has a big sign that says wrap it up. So if any of you want me to finish, just go and borrow the sign. Now, as a, a young man, I had a, a certain mentor and he published my best ever idea without me. And this was quite a blow to a young lad, as you might imagine. And I don't want to ever do that to anyone else. So can you see the little pictures of people in these slides? Every time you see one of those, that's me trying to give credit to someone. Actually, it'd be really good if you asked me questions as we go and stuff, because after I'd been lecturing about 20 years, they sent me on a course on how to lecture. And they said the, the single worst way to teach is to stand behind a podium and talk at the audience. So it would be really good if instead of saving your questions to the end, you said them during the time. Now, I don't know how we're going to do that with the microphone. Anyhow, I want to give credit to Dr. Jonathan Whitaker and Dr. Peter Gill. Uh, you might think I'm defending my baby here, uh, and to some extent I am. Uh, that's because we three hold the patent. Now, this is an amazing thing. The Forensic Science Service is a commercial organisation and it patents your ideas. So, yeah, we hold the patent. Anyhow, I can't actually teach my material in two hours. I, I cannot teach continuous models for complex mixtures in two hours. So, I have set myself up to fail. But I was taught to try and teach a little bit well rather than a lot badly. So I'm going to try and do that if, if you'll bear with me. What I'm going to try and do is uh, show what's wrong with existing methods. I, I believe we're coming to the end of the binary era. And that's true both of random man not excluded and my old likelihood ratio methods. I believe we're coming to the end of those. And everyone in this room will see, see a transition to more advanced methods. The pressure for change is coming from a thing called a non-concordance. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. But a non-concordance is where the person of interest is either A, B, or AA, and one or both of the alleles are not seen in the profile. I'll try and stick to using the definition of uh, LCN for 34 cycle and LTDNA for anything low template, whether at 28 or 34, or if you're doing the Y chromosome 30 or 32. In fact, if you go into the new multiplexes, we'll be at 29 and 30 for some of them. Which we're, uh, we're going in March, you'll notice it's March. So. I, um, I've set myself the goal of aligning Europe and the USA. I, I want to um, have the same recommendations out of SWIGDAM and the ISFG. Now, my belief is I stand no chance at all. The, the Atlantic is a lot wider than I ever thought it was. Uh, and I've thought long and hard about why this is, and the reason is we have no principles. Uh, thanks, thanks for the titters. Um, does that translate? I don't know. Does, um, I, I don't mean we're unprincipled. We just have not laid down the principles of how we make decisions. I'm, I'm very deathly serious, and I'm just going to show you a really little one. So there are two definitions of heterozygote balance. And one is the shorter allele divided by the taller. And if you do that, heterozygote balance is always between 0 and 1. And there is another one where you take the high molecular weight allele and divide it by the low molecular weight allele. And heterozygote balance is between 0 and infinity. Now it turns out, well, I'll take you back a bit, a statistic is any description of the data. Right? And when you make a statistic, you summarise the data. And whenever you summarise anything, you lose information. Right? All summaries are losses. I hope that's self-evident. I mean, they probably taught you it at undergraduate. But let's imagine I gave the mean height of this class. Right? That's a summary. And I've lost information. I could not recreate the height of every person in this class from the mean but I could create the mean from the height of every person, right? I can go in one direction but not back. It's like a degradation of the knowledge. All right. I can calculate the top one from the bottom, but not the bottom one from the top. All right? I could always go in that direction, 
but I cannot go in that direction. The top one is a more degraded summary of the information. And the top one's what we all use, all right? I, I've given up, right? I've, I must have said this, I don't know, a hundred times in print or in lectures. And three very distinguished presenters have been up here today, uh, all very intelligent men, and they all used the top one. And it is an inferior summary of the information. Now, look, I, I, uh, I'm not actually an academic imperialist. I, I feel no burning need to convert you all. If what I say doesn't make sense, just toss me out. I'm, I'm fine with that. But here, here it is done the other way. So here's heterozygote balance, and again, you see me giving credit to some people. Defined the other way. And this is exactly the same graph as Todd and Michael gave, and it's exactly the same as the words that... Um, that we've heard expressed about heterozygote balance, <coughs> but you've all heard it said that it's, you know, around, you know, 0.6 or something. Well, it's actually between 0.6 and 1.66, and we know the high molecular weight allele amplifies slightly less. So can you see the average for that thing is just slightly below one? All right, now I want to make a couple of other points. Um, everyone's talked a lot of sense. This thing is a continuum, right? That little uh, variance just, just slowly gets bigger as the heights get lower. So just orientate you, heterozygote balance, average peak height. And it just slowly gets wider as the peaks get smaller. And this is entirely true at 28, which is what that is. If I cranked it up to 34, I would get exactly the same graph, but displaced to the right. In fact, I've, we've done it, 28, 29, 30, 31. It just displaces to the right, and that's what Todd said less than half an hour ago. This is, this is like the shape of our amplifications, and we believe it's entirely because of that sampling step at the start where you pipette the material out. You do not get an exact balance of the two alleles. Just uh, introduce one other, the, the mix, mixture proportion. Uh, we need to understand how much this varies across loci. So here we go. Here's the mixture proportion at locus 1, and here's the mixture proportion at locus 2. And we can do that at, say, 15 loci if you're using identifier. And there's some sort of average across that. And each one of those loci will be above or below that average. And I've tried to make a little picture there. And I plot the Ds. All right, these are the displacements from the average for each locus. And we see exactly the same picture. The mixture proportion is enormously consistent across loci as long as your peaks are big. And look, I'll tell you, this is true for the Y as well. This, this is, I don't want to say universal truth, that's getting a bit big, but this seems to be the pattern. You get down the bottom and the variability blows out. And I think I heard Todd and Michael say that as well. All right, so why, why, uh, why do I think we're all going to have to change? Well, I've been enormously wrong about predicting change, so don't take me too seriously. But around about 1999, uh, we began to realise something. So let's imagine we have a single replicate and the suspect is an AB, and the stain is A. And we imagine that A peak is of, say, height 400 RFU. I hope you would all go exclusion. Right? One peak, height 400, suspect AB exclude, right? It would be good to hear yes. Yes would be good, thank you. All right, I'm just going to move that down from 400. Down, 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 exclude, 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 exclude and I'm going to cross my stochastic threshold, and I'm suddenly going to go strong evidence. Right? Exclude, 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 strong evidence. And we all know that is not the way biological processes work. So there is something wrong with the binary model. And look, why did it take us so long to work that out? So I, I wrote a paper with Peter Gill and, and company in 1999, and we sort of outlined the solution to this. Now, I'm going to take you through that, but it's almost unimplemented. So I'm about to teach you something that's almost unimplemented, except 
in two places in the United States. The OCME, the Office of the Chief Medical Examiner in New York, has implemented it. And Keith Inman, who I hope you will recognise as using it. ENSFI, the European network, is going to go to it, and the Australasian network is going to go to it. So I'm going to outline that to you, and you can do with it what you want. So we should have noticed something was up earlier. We all thought the 2P rule was conservative, but it's not. I need to try and prove that to you, and it's going to need some pretty heavy mathematical trawling. You only need to ever get through this once in your life, right? If you understand it once, that'll, that'll do. You're then in a position to discuss solutions and the way forward. And look, a lot of you um, look young enough to, to, to initiate change, you know, and I'd like to see you do it, except I'm not an, an imperialist. All right, the third law of probability. Um, there's only three, and, uh, and I only need the third one, f law for this. The probability of A and B is the probability of A times the probability of B, and that vertical line means given. All right. Now, I've had a few interesting things with that vertical line. I, I published a paper once, and the referee got back to me and said, oh, it was an interesting paper, but he thought my division signs were a bit vertical. <laughs> All right. That's not a division sign. That means if or given. There's no reason why you have to take out A. You can take out B. So the probability of B times the probability of A given B. And I'll write that out in words. Okay, it's called a conditional probability. Now, please close your notes. Now, actually, you haven't got the notes. I had anticipated you'd all be given my slides and handouts, and I don't want you to peep ahead to the answers. But you haven't got the notes, so you can't. <laughs> all right. How tall is Sarah? Who said I don't know? You don't know because, okay, but you know, she might be between five foot and six foot five, is that most women? Oh, yes. All right, I like your answer, all right? Because <laughs> it turns out Sarah is a three-year-old. <laughs> okay, and that, I don't know whether you had something in your head when I said how tall is Sarah, all right? But when I said she's three, did you change that? I mean, if you didn't have anything there in the first place, then you didn't change, right? But, um, I mean, another one Ian Evett does is, uh, well, actually, Sarah's a giraffe. You know? All right? But I, uh, look, I, I had this written uh, down as Sarah's a netball representative. So netball's a game we play in New Zealand. I don't think you play it, so I changed this to basketball. So Sarah's a basketball representative, so we now think she's, you know, tall. Six foot to something, right? What's the principle? Is there a principle? The more you know, the better your probability assessment gets. You couldn't do one at all until you knew something, right? So your probability assessment gets better every time you use reliable information. Is that okay as a principle? Because it really applies to DNA. Right, your probability assessments get better if you use reliable information. They actually get worse if you use unreliable, but they get better if you use reliable. Is that, I mean, does that ring down in the deep scientific core of your inner being as some truth? All right, beards and moustaches. Now, I'll make this it, all right? I ought to deal with you, that's fair. Okay, this is the last little exercise. Now, some of you in this room are male. You don't have to do anything. It should be a thing you're good at. <laughs> All right. I uh, need you women to grow beards and moustaches. Now, this will be difficult for you, most of you. And <laughs> what I would like you to do is think of the male most nearly related to you. So that's probably your father or your brother, right? Now, showing the initiative that's ingrained in all forensic scientists, can you pick up a piece of paper off that pad in front of you and draw the facial hair of the male representative most like you? No, you can. I know you can. Do I need to do one for you? Right, this is, this is me. Actually, I'm going to do my brother. Right? 
male representative most. So my brother's gay, right? And he's that doesn't write. Okay. And he's got one of these sort of little gay moustaches. All right. <laughs> so can you women all please draw a little representation of the facial hair of? Yeah, come on, get your paper out. You can do it. Even people from Alaska can do this. Come on. This is also an opportunity to show those art skills that you learnt in, in biology and never use, right? Actually, if you do as badly as me, you're, you go to the bottom of the class. Has everyone got a, some little face now? All right? Okay. Well, gosh, when I said little face, I didn't mean quite that little. Okay. Now, some of you have beards. Is that right? Okay. Can all of those who have beards, including the males, please come up and stand behind me? No, you can. Come on, stand up. You can do this. This is an interact. Don't we stand up in America? <laughs> Guys, <laughs> can you just stand up where you are? <laughs> okay. You all have beards? All right. I want to calculate the probability of a moustache given a beard. I don't know how we're going to do this, but can you all hold your faces up? Okay. Who's got a moustache? I'm going to be me instead of my brother. All right, I have a moustache. Okay, can someone count how many people are standing up? Okay, and how many have got moustaches? Hands, hands up moustaches. You definitely have a moustache. I can see you. I can't see that one over there. Oh, no, you have a moustache and a beard, don't you? All right. Okay, so there are 25 of us standing up and 30 of us have a moustache. <laughs> now, sit down, please. We, we had a mathematical meltdown there. Okay. What I really want to show is what does that vertical line mean, all right? You make a little set of what's behind the bar and you count how, much, how many of that has what's in front of the bar. So, if I'm going to do moustache given beard, I make a little group of people who've got beards and I count how many have moustaches. All right, now I wish it hadn't been 25 and 30 or the other way around, right? Let's say it was 30 of us standing and 25 had moustaches, all right? That shows that whatever that turns out to be, 82% of, of people with a beard have a moustache. And that is the probability of a moustache given a beard, or is that, is that obvious? All right, we're all cool with that? Okay, because coming sometime tomorrow morning when I'm on, we're gonna do an exercise in conditional probability using evens and L's, all right? And with that somewhat failed exercise, <laughs> I shall allow, does Deborah close for proceedings? and I'll see you tomorrow.